Hello, everyone, and welcome to another talk with the experts at Homeland Security Today. I am Christina Tanaschuk, the executive editor of Homeland Security Today. And this Halloween, we are talking about real life boogeymen. Uh, we're talking about human trafficking, and we're talking with two incredible experts who have started uh, a, a wonderful project uh, to develop a database of human trafficking and all kinds of different information for law enforcement and others to use across the country. So we're very excited to welcome Heather Fisher, who is a senior advisor for human rights crimes at Thomson Reuters Special Services. Uh, she serves as their special services executive leader, uh, informing the work of the intersection of national security and human rights crimes. So that includes human trafficking, uh, child exploitation, uh, and she also leads the company's strategy to promote women, peace, and security. So the other exciting thing about Heather is she was the former human trafficking czar uh, for the president. Uh, she coordinated the executive office of the president and the 20 federal agencies on the president's interagency task force to monitor and combat trafficking in person. So Heather, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. It's great to be here, Christina. I appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. Um, we also have uh, Manal Patel Davis, and she is currently the director of the mayor's office of human trafficking and domestic violence. Uh, and she also previously served as special advisor to the mayor on human trafficking, uh, the first municipal level position of its kind. So we have two incredible people who are going to talk to us about a, a new project. Uh, so I'd love you to tell us in your words more about uh, the how Thomson Reuters, the city of Houston, and the mayor's office of human trafficking and domestic violence are partnering to launch this global resource against human trafficking. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Christina. I'd be happy to get us started this morning. Um, so eight and a half years ago, I was appointed by the former mayor to the first of its kind position in the United States. And my initial charge was to ensure that we had trafficking victims being able to access all of the city's housing stock and building a bridge to that really robust system that exists here to address homelessness, which is a big vulnerability for victims of trafficking. But once I was actually in my post and we started to mine all of the opportunity that was actually available through municipal assets to increase identification, to do all kinds of things, to have safeguarding policies and how you're procur procuring labor with our $6.2 billion budget, we really saw that the opportunity was wide. And so our strategic plan went across five different objectives above and beyond her initial ask and so for the last eight years under Mayor, Mayor Sylvester Turner in the city of Houston, we've been able to de develop a few of the toolkits that we've launched with, with Thomson Reuters through Heather's partnership and partnership with her and her company, I should say, and in deep collaboration with our community. And so the three trafficking toolkits that are capturing all of the tacit knowledge, all, this, all of the step-by-step things that need to happen to implement them in other cities and communities literally around the globe are first the large scale sporting events toolkit or a mega sporting event toolkit where you're safeguarding not just for safe sex trafficking but for labor trafficking and it includes a speakers bureau guide all kinds of different assets you know police operations and what they look like and the summaries from them as well the second toolkit is our Watch for Traffic media campaign, which we hosted before, during, and after our Super Bowl, which we hosted a few years ago. And that includes TV, radio, billboard assets in two or three different languages. One of the assets for buses and taxi signs is actually in nine different languages that we have translated, nine different images as well. And so that generated 98 million impressions in the city of Houston over an eight month period. And we essentially had an 80% increase in calls to the National Human Trafficking Tip Hotline and a 61% increase in cases confirmed at the time that the market was saturated. Our third toolkit is an anti-luring social media toolkit. And this is for Instagram and Facebook, and it's for two different sets. We have 24 images that people can run, communities can run, governments can run over a three month period. Uh, we have 12 images for youth ages 12 to 24, and then 12 images and posts 
for ages 35 to 55 for caregivers and parents to increase victim identification and then to prevent trafficking to begin with. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so Thomson Reuters, why did they get involved? Yeah, so that's a great question. Actually, uh, prior to me coming to Thomson Reuters, I've worked with Minal's office over the years. So I got to watch the entire trajectory of um, this body of work come together. And at different um, times in my career, I've actually had an opportunity to work on two of the toolkits in, in my tenure working on human trafficking. So it's been an exciting journey to watch the mayor's office and in particular Mino at the helm of this work. Um, and it's in our estimation, one of the best uh, products that has ever been made available to the field. Obviously it was created for the city of Houston, but Mino has been so generous and so has the mayor to offer it, um, their learnings, their blueprint, the, the playbook to the larger anti-trafficking community. But for Thomson Reuters specifically, we, we have a history and commitment to countering human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking over the years. Initially, this work started through the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is our primary mechanism uh, for our philanthropic work. Um, and that looks like uh, charitable giving, capacity guilt, building, and pro bono legal assistance. But since 2018, the business side of Thomson Reuters has supported, supported law enforcement investigations and more recently, helping to address forced labor and global supply chains. Uh, Thomson Reuters is committed to continuing to expand the ecosystem of information and technology and subject matter expertise to support this mission set um, to help illuminate and identify human trafficking networks, facilitate prosecutions, and help victims and survivors on the road to recovery. So this partnership with the City of Houston Mayor's Office uh, it's very full so circle for me personally, but it's the latest expression of our commitment to thought leadership and capacity building both here in the United States and worldwide. So we think by partnering together, we'll ensure that Minal's hard work and the mayor's legacy of countering human trafficking will endure. And we're really proud to partner together to launch this new resource center for all to enjoy. It's, it's an excellent project. I know just from working with uh, many veterans affairs groups, you know, having a place where all the information is consolidated is really helpful because there's so many different programs and they're all over and it's hard to find. So it's incredible that the Thomson Reuters, you know, with your reach is able to share these resources with so many people. I mean, I love that, that it's global, um, particularly, you note know, in, in the press release about the project that the state department estimates more than 27 million people have fallen victim to human trafficking. Uh, do you see this as a growing challenge in the United States or, or are some of these efforts working to curb it? I, I think it's both. So actually, um, according to the International Labor Organization, where's, where we get our best estimates, human trafficking or modern slavery, as it sometimes is called, depending on what um, where you are in the world, it affects an estimated 49.6 million people around the world annually. And the profits that stem from this illicit activity is an estimated $150 billion in the shadow economy. So when we talk about human trafficking, we obviously focus on the victim and the human rights violation, and I think rightfully so. But for the international relations and homeland security community that myself and your audience belongs to, I think there's often a misconception that this is this human rights um, abuse does not meet the existential, right? And the reality is, is that this crime is also a national security and economic security risk. So in order to counter these massive numbers that are estimated by the International Labor Organization, we really do need a coordinated whole of society solution at scale because human traffickers are very sophisticated and coordinated. So from our perspective at Thomson Reuters, that's why we're so dedicated to using technology as a key, key driver to enable um, the, our work to counter human trafficking, whether it's from recruiting victims to facilitating the buyer to purchase the victims um, for, from the trafficker, we're determined to use our technology and our data to confront this criminal activity. 
That's that's exactly what's needed. It's great to see you all doing something very concrete. I think a lot of people want to engage and help to assure that we stop human trafficking, uh, but you provide them a really concrete way to do that. Um, can you tell us more about how the collaboration will facilitate mu new municipal campaigns to detect and prevent trafficking? Uh, what insights can you share from the city of Houston, Manal? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, so the collaboration just with the first three toolkits includes probably about 30 months of work by my team and I before we went to implementation. So one of the things we'd be doing by the cities, the communities, and the people, because really anyone can use it, um, use these items, right, depending on which ones they are, certainly the first three, we are saving them an absolute ton of time, a ton of learning, a, learn, a ton of time testing that we spent here to really perfect these items to make sure we were hitting the target audiences, to make sure we were messaging properly. So that's one way that will facilitate it. They're free and they're easy to access and download. And then the insights that I can share, we know that they were that they're proven, right? Because we have, before this partnership, taken this work nationally and globally, but this is really going to be bringing it to scale, right? We've already had a tremendous amount of interest in this, but essentially we had replicated this model or aspects of this model through a two-day immersion program that we had hosted here in the city of Houston in 2019, where 24 mayor's office executives came from 18 U.S. cities, those larger and smaller than our city, Houston's fourth largest city, and spent time learning how to do this over two days and then went ahead and replicated different aspects around it. And because the domestic version was so su successful, we then hosted an international government version where folks from different countries and their representatives, you know, came and spent the same kind of time with us with, of course, an, of course, an international context, uh, the kind that Heather alluded to earlier. And so we know these things are proven. And those are the ways that we're hoping to facilitate, not just through government, but again, community, because, like I said, this didn't happen without the input of local, national and international stakeholders. We took all of that into consideration. when These were developed. So. Absolutely. Uh, that really shows how much this public-private partnership uh, is important, even, even the two of you partnering public-private. Tell us more about how you, know, you would advise municipals and how important that public-private partnership is, because many people are trafficked certainly in a commercial way, like the airlines, all these folks that are not non-governmental uh, can play a role and certainly a positive one. So what's your advice for everyone looking at this? I, I think that's a great question, Christina. And I will tell you, um, after 10 year, years in various roles, both in and out of government, I see that the most strategic and comprehensive way forward is through public-private partnerships. And initially, uh, the work that I was doing living in the state of New York at an organization called Level 46 really was mobilizing communities, working with task forces, working with federal, state, and local governments to educate uh, the people in the community and to do uh, conduct outreach, to talk to hotels and truck stops, um, to educate medical community, and really bring about that capacity building, which is how I came across Mino's work. So um, that those really are my roots, though I became a policy person later. All of that community-based work has helped inform, I think, some of the best policy that we have here in the United States. But further to that, um, post-government uh, service for me. I'm co-chair of a public-private working group with the federal government, financial institutions, data providers like Thomson Reuters, and, and leading nonprofits. And we've learned that no one entity can take on this work alone. I talked about that criminal network that exists in the trafficking space. Um, but we have found by working together in a coordinated and strategic fashion we can work with the private sector to really go upstream, identify and prosecute bad actors, protect survivors, and prevent further victimization. So it really is a whole of society approach. Law enforcement and the Homeland Security professionals is one segment that we're hoping to reach, but we understand that it's going to take all of us to counter human trafficking. Yeah, and I just like to... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I would just like to add, as far as public-private partnerships, you really want to think about it as strategic alliances or joint action, right? So, for example, Heather mentioned Love 146. When we did our anti-learning social media toolkit, it's because the mayor here doesn't have purview over the schools. So it's very, and it's a decentralized system here, so it's very difficult for us to be able to access children. So we thought, well, social media is the best way to do this when you can't get in through the schools as easily as one should maybe be able to. And so we didn't have the marketing. We didn't have the amazing resources of a Love 146. If you go on their website, they have all of these online safety tools and things like that. So we asked them, literally picked up the phone, called them and asked them and said, can your marketing folks design this? Would they be willing to do this if we paid for the Facebook and Instagram ads over the course of the months. And they did all of that amazing work. And because we had a deficit there and they had a strength there, that joint action led to 4 million impressions with our anti-learning social media toolkit that because we created it here together and the cause is good, right? We're trying to get at children and families. We actually shared it with 22 partners across the United States to get those 4 million impressions. So it's critical. It's the crux of everything we do here at the city of Houston mayor's office. Well, that's excellent. That's That was actually my next question for you all because uh, HS Today works with a number of nonprofits that work in human trafficking. And we interviewed someone when actually we went over to Ukraine and talked about uh, human trafficking and the threats and vulnerabilities of populations that are at war uh, because people are desperate and and certainly traffickers take advantage of that as well. So how how are you working with other nonprofits that that work specifically in human trafficking? Yeah, so we work with a number of nonprofits. I mentioned already we have a pretty robust philanthropic portfolio. Um, and, and so obviously we have charitable giving, but we like to go beyond that um, to actually be a true partner. So we work with organizations like the National Center for Missing Exploited Children, which is U.S. government's uh, clearinghouse. We also support actually in the government, the Department of Homeland Security Center to Counter Human Trafficking, which has a great outreach mechanism with their blue campaign. And I'm chairwoman of the Freedom Collaborative, which is the largest anti-human trafficking nonprofit globally. So we'll be working with all of these great networks to push out the toolkits and um, do more than just what I think is a good first step, which is the philanthropic impact really come alongside of great organizations who are force multipliers to um, the major stakeholders combating human trafficking and having more of a, a strengthening and a, and a real true partnership together. Absolutely. Yeah. If I could add also, you know, United Against Human Trafficking is a local nonprofit here that actually put up the first $12,000 for our Watch for Traffic media campaign because the office was so new and I had such a small traditional government small budget that I hadn't been able to do all of the fundraising for it yet. And so they did that and that helped bring funders to the table where I was able to pull in a lot more money to make sure we're getting all of the media assets, you know, smattered across every possible medium in our city. And then a management consultancy, but PR kind of mix called Deitzer literally donated about a half a million dollars of in-kind services to create um, the Watch for Traffic media campaign and all of the assets. They were just tremendous. It was a gentleman named Brad Ashton over there. Um, so we work with or, you know, I know we're talking about nonprofits now, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that group in addition to 40 others that we typically collaborate with, or get input from, for anything we're doing here from the Mayor's Policy Council. That's the formation. We have them in here locally. Well, that's, I mean, what we're really talking about is leveraging everyone and the skills and talents they bring to help with this mission. So, I mean, kudos to you to recognizing that. Um, I think there are a lot of people who want to help for varying reasons. And it seems like your campaign is, is working with all of them and leveraging all of that talent. So congratulations to you. Um, so you talked a little bit about the different types of toolkits and the information you're sharing. Who would you say are the audience for this campaign? I would say that governments, for sure. That's where our expertise was developed, you know, 
So any kind of government, local, state, national governments can use this. You have to have a designated point person that's responsible for making sure this is coordinated, executed on. That's my tip or advice if anyone's looking for it. And then I think because so much of the work that we were done, what that we did was done in communities, nonprofits, even people, you know, like parents and caregivers, if they wanted to download the anti-luring social media toolkit, they could use their own social media accounts to do it. So the reach is really broad. But as we go into developing and adding additional toolkits, which we plan to do with Heather and Thomson Reuters, those will be more specific to government. But these three, really, anybody with the resources, the time, and the will to do it can use them. And but, I'll just say okay. quickly, too, we, we also, uh, at Thomson Reuters, the bulk of our customers are, tend to be attorneys and law enforcement in two of our markets. And so um, when you think about task forces that are being set up, whether it's by the Department of Justice or by a municipality or another government body, we hope um, that those coordinators, typically there's one prosecutor and one law enforcement lead that runs the entire task force or working group, we hope that they'll actually come to our website as customers and not reinvent the wheel, that they'll get the advantage of all of this hard work that Minal and the team have put together and start with their best foot forward. So we're really excited to engage our own global customers um, and give them the tools and resources that they really need if they want to either start a, a, a working group or improve the work that they're doing or take on a new facet that they hadn't considered before. Yeah, great point. Excellent. So I know I want you all to get back to combating human trafficking. So as my final question, um, what can the public do to support you? Because I'm sure people are going to see this interview and go, I want to get involved. And how can they do that? I think that they can review the toolkits, download the toolkits, post it on their social media, make sure that they do some kind of advocacy in their towns, communities, with their governments, with local law enforcement, and really take it up and say, we'd love to see this done. It's already been prepared for you. All you have to do is X. And maybe do that work for those entities to make it a bit easier for them. That's oftentimes very helpful. We've seen that with some of our policies, right? People have bought us draft policies or even, hey, what about this for an ordinance? Can you get this done? And we're exercising that kind of reflective governance, right? You ask us for something and then it starts to get reflected in our governing documents here and that reflective governance has to come from the community right they sort of have to demand and engage in that way to be able to get their government organizations to reflect what it is they want to do so that's what i'd add, add for that or say for that i th and i will echo everything Minal just said i also want this audience to know specifically that national security professionals are on the front lines of anti-human trafficking and child safety protection work and as such, your audience is really well positioned to use their vocation right where they are to help counter abuses and protect vulnerable people. But anyone can use their current profession as an on-ramp to engagement uh, to counter human trafficking. I think education is key. And so tuning into this program is the first step in making a difference. And we'll hope that you'll join us to counter human trafficking. Manal Heather, thank you so, so much for joining us today uh, and for, for spending your careers uh, and lives combating this, this scourge. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, and I hope you still go on to have a happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you, Christina.